The stories shared on It Takes Balls are unique to the individual sharing. Always speak with your trusted medical provider for treatment options specific to you. Welcome back to It Takes Pulse, presented by Testicular Cancer Awareness Foundation. Today's guest is coming from us from the opposite side of the pelvis. He's a colon cancer guy. Trevor Maxwell is the founder of Man Up to Cancer, which we'll let him explain what that is. But Trevor, thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's great to see you. Um, it's, it's just, you bring a smile to my face because when I started Man Up to Cancer way back um, in early 2020, you were one of the first people that I met. And um, to see you doing this advocacy work and, and everything else just brings me a lot of joy. Like you're crushing it and I'm proud of you. And also congratulations on being married now. And I think having a dog, you don't have any kids yet, do you? No. Or is that something you guys have talked about? Hopefully. Yeah. 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 We'll see how things go with one testicle, but. Well, I was good. Right. I mean, the, but Hey, we're in 2023, man. There's all kinds of, uh, yeah. but. So before but congratulations, I just want to say that, man, like I, I've seen the photos of, of like your wedding and everything and like you and your wife look super happy. That's awesome. Thank you. And if it sounds echoey in here or looks bare, like I used to have a painting right here, it's because we're in the middle of moving and uh, poor Ashley and her parents are doing everything while we're recording this, but um, <laughs> I get a little break. So <clears throat> thank um, you, Ashley. <laughs> All right. So before we get into what Man Up to Cancer is in the mission, tell me about yourself and your journey with cancer. Ooh, yeah. Um, I'm just a kid from Maine. Um, I was born and raised here in Maine. Think of it as the best place to live that I could, that, that I could choose to live. And, um, <clears throat> I was 41 years old. Um, my wife and I are actually high school sweethearts. So we, we started dating when we were 16 and, um, had a couple amazing daughters. Um, Sage it was 12 and Elsie was 10 when I was diagnosed back in March of 2018. So, um, yeah, I was just kind of cruising through life. I was always, I was a writer, um, public relations consultant, communications consultant, and my wife is a teacher, um, at a public school here in Maine. And we were just, you know, doing the raising a family thing. And then the life asteroid of cancer, um, kind of exploded over our house, um, in March of 2018 when I got diagnosed with colon cancer and, for any of you guys listening on the other, you know, the, the other side of the pelvis, um, I, I honestly didn't know too much about what my colon was. I figured it was somewhere in there doing something with digestion, but I couldn't tell you that it was like my large intestine or that I would ever have cancer there. So complete and utter shock. Yeah. And like politics, they reach across the aisle. We're reaching across the taint here. <laughs> I appreciate that. You know, I, I, I have much love for all of our testicular and prostate guys. Um, so yeah, you know, doing a little PSA here, um, and not the prostate PSA, but the public service announcement around colon cancer, um, especially it's on the rise for people under 50. So talk to your doctor about screenings, you know, get your colonoscopy if you're 45 and you haven't had one yet. Um, I had no idea like about what, what it was. And then all of a sudden I'm facing stage four, life-threatening cancer at age 41 with two young kids. So talk about the diagnosis with the kids, because that's, that's something that is, is big. Yeah. I mean, that was for Sarah and I, I got diagnosed at the, when I had a colonoscopy um, and I had like a 10 centimeter tumor in my large intestine, in my colon. And that was the first thing we did was, I mean, first we were just speechless and just staring at each other with our jaws just wide open. And then we got back in the car and we just looked at each other. And of course, just the, the water works, like just you're, you're in shock, but then you just, you, then you think of your kids and it's like the tears just started like pouring down my face and, and hers too. And we're just, that was our first question was, how are we going to tell the kids about this? And that was one of the toughest conversations we've ever had. And you know, they were 12 and 10. So their, their ability to understand cancer and what it is and everything else was, was pretty limited. But even by that age, kids have an idea, right? They hear the word cancer. It's scary. Like they think of people dying, it, you know, we've had some people in our families or people that they known who've had cancer and died. So there's a huge weight on that conversation. It's like, what do you even say? So I, we vividly remember sitting them down and again, you know, trying to be age appropriate, right? Like, and not scare them, but to give them the honest, some of the honest truth about what was going on and just saying, you know, 
let's talk about, you know, I have been diagnosed with cancer. So the doctors say I have this cancer and basically, you know, we talked about what it was, you know, cells in your body that just replicate uncontrollably and cause these tumors. And, you know, looking back, they, you know, kids are so much smarter than we give them credit for. Like they, they know what's happening. They respond to your emotions. They, they know what you're going through. And um, I think that set the tone because we've always been open with them about my cancer. Like that first day, Elsie said, well, they're, so the doctors are going to, you're going to, I said, I'm going to have a surgery and I'm going to do chemotherapy. And then Elsie was like, and then you'll be done forever. Like the cancer will be gone forever. And even with a little kid, you know, you have that choice to make, like, how, how realistic do you be here? And what I said was, there's no guarantees. No one could ever give you a guarantee about whether this cancer is going to stay away forever or not. But there's one thing that I can always guarantee you. There's one thing I will always promise you is that I will do everything in my power to get the best possible treatment and to do everything I can to be with you here healthy for as long as I can be. And, you know, at the time that was enough for that. They were like, okay, well then <laughs> dad's got it. And then they went off and, you know, watch one of their shows, you know, so, it, but it set the tone for open communication because, you know, I think of generationally, like when my grandfather had cancer, you know, it wasn't ever discussed. No one, no one was supposed to talk about it. No one was supposed to know about it. Like it was just, and, and I think that creates, you know, it's not that one was worse or better. I, I just think that being open about it because they're going to know anyway. So, so being honest with them is going to show them that you trust them and that they can trust you. So that kind of set the tone. They are 17 and 15. Now I am so blessed to make it to five years since that conversation. And I have Sage getting ready to go to college this fall. She's a senior in high school and Elsie's a sophomore. And, you know, I think, we, we've always had that open conversation. Not We don't go too deep into the weeds. Like they don't need to know every single detail about my cancer, but they need to know the basics. Like, you know, what's my prognosis? What is, what are the, what are my teams doing? What's our plan? And, and so we do have those regular conversations and they know when I have my scans, we talk about what the results are and we talk about what we're doing about it. And um, so, yeah, I just, wow. The kids for me was, it was the biggest thing because as a dad, you know, your, your role, your top role in your life is to nurture and protect these children. And then you get this life threatening illness and it's terrifying. It's shocking. It's scary. It's, um, there's a lot of grief. Right. And so as you know, I, I went through some severe mental health issues because of my diagnosis and it wasn't around me. Right. Like if I was just alone with nobody in the world, you know, yeah, I would have been grie grie I would have been grieving, but it would have been much different. Like I was facing stage four cancer with little kids and that was really hard for me mentally to adjust to. Yeah. It's definitely a delicate line to, to walk. And, um, it's important for them to know too, for their own health. I mean, maybe they don't share concerns yeah. of their health with you, but when they go privately to their doctor, they can, you know, say, yeah, my dad had colon cancer and it's something that I want to be screened for earlier. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a great point. And to add to that, I have Lynch syndrome. So I have no idea that what, I didn't even know what Lynch syndrome was and most people don't, but after I got diagnosed because I was, you know, relatively young, they did genetic testing and, and we do have this thing called Lynch syndrome, which is basically one of our genes in our bodies that's responsible for being like the spell check. If, if genes, uh, if cells start messing up, um, one of those genes doesn't function because it's a hereditary thing. And so my kids know, and, and now I have like seven or eight relatives who've done the test. They know they have the Lynch syndrome. Uh, pre, it, basically it's a predisposition. It doesn't mean you're automatically going to get cancer, but it means you you're predisposed genetically to developing a cancer. And so now to your point, I can share that with the girls and everyone in our family so that they know, you know, when they turn 18 or after that, they can be tested for the gene and, um, and then they can be, you know, I'm all about being proactive and knowledge is power. And, you know, it's a cliche, but I, that's how I live my life and I believe it. So giving them that knowledge that they know that we have this thing in our family so that they can be proactive and make sure they're, like you said, talking to their doctors about, Hey, my dad and my relatives and, and Lynch syndrome gives them something that I didn't have. Right. I didn't have that knowledge to 
think about t- testing earlier or being on top of my blood work. When I got diagnosed, I hadn't seen my primary care physician in five or six years because I was just a young, younger, healthy guy. Yeah. And uh, we'll pl- let you plug your podcast at the end, but you have a great episode oh. with your daughter who, I mean, that episode had my mom and I both crying oh. separately. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's yeah, just- man, that was, <laughs> yep. Thank you. Um, so let's use that kind of, you were, we're talking about, you know, sharing it with your, your children as a segue into men up to cancer. And I'm going to say like older guys are known for kind of keeping things close to their vest. So you're kind of changing the tide of that with man up to cancer. So talk about like where you were yeah. when man up to cancer, you know, hit you, hit your, mm-hmm. uh, your noggin. Absolutely. The, the first six to eight months of my diagnosis and going into, I had colon surgery, then I had chemo, then I had my first, I had, so my disease spread to my liver and then it, and then it ended up spreading into my abdomen, into my peritoneum. So I had metastatic disease. So that first six to eight months I had, colon surgery, chemo, liver surgery. And I was a wreck. Like I was a, I was grieving. I was sad. I was anxious. I was depressed. I was, my mental health was at pretty much rock bottom and, you know, kind of skip to skip ahead is that through the love of my family and my friends, I was able to get to this place where I said, I may not have hundred percent control of my cancer, I don't believe that I have a hundred percent control of that from like a, like a thinking, you know, in terms of like what I can do from, from my mindset and everything else to control my cancer. But I do have control over how I experience my day to day, like, you know, trying to do something to make my mindset better while I'm going through it. So through that love process, I was able to get to this huge point for guys, which is this. And you'll, I'm sure this will resonate with you is I got to the point where I realized I needed help and accept it and accepting that like, Hey, Trevor, you can't, you're in a pit, man. You're in this big pit of, of despair and you're looking up and you think you can climb out of it on your own. And, you know, somehow I'm just gonna, <clears throat> I'm gonna man up and I'm gonna get out of this pit on my own and somehow I'm gonna fix it doesn't work that way. <laughs> you, most of the time you're going to need help. And for a lot of guys getting to that point where we accept that we need help and reaching out for it is a tough point. But I was there, like there was no other way I was going to get out of that pit if I didn't get some help. So I reached out and I started getting um, counseling. So individual count going to group therapy, um, so meeting people in person, this was pre pandemic. So we had, we actually had like group counseling meetings, um, meeting people online. So just what getting help to me looked like was just reaching out number one to like others who were walking the walk or had gone through that walk before, um, counselors who are, you know, there so that you can just process, um, exercise, music, meditation, like just using the tools in the toolbox to improve my mental health and get out of that pit. But it was other people who were, had that hand ready for me. Like I think of just one person in particular, Patty, my counselor at the Dempsey center here in Maine was a lifesaver. Like I went into her office completely broken and feeling like I was going to die, going to leave my kids behind. And I was inconsolable. I would just spend like an hour just like crying on her floor. Like I was, a, I was a, effing mess. I don't know what I can say here, but, um, you can say it. I was an effing, yeah, okay. <laughs> I was a fucking mess. And Patty was there for me and she would say, Trevor, you know, it's normal what you're feeling for you to have this life threatening illness, like what you're going through, this grief, this mental health, it's normal and you're going to get through it and you're doing the right thing. And, and I was, I just had to trust her. Sometimes when you're at the bottom in that place of mental health and you feel like you're never going to get out of it, sometimes you have to have others believe for you, even when you don't believe it yourself. And Patty and others did that for me. And so as I started getting my mental health back, like doing that process of helping myself, I was like getting better. And my cancer was still being a stubborn bastard. I kept going through surgeries and chemo. I was like, just for reference, I've been in this for five years and I've had very, very few breaks. Like it's been in the trenches almost the entire time. But with my mental health, I started from that help getting better and better. And that's when I realized this goes back to, I am going to answer your question, believe it or not. (laughs) 
I started seeing that everywhere I went to get help, whether it was the Dempsey Center here in Maine, whether it was Colon Town online, other places online, like Fight CRC, like as I started engaging with the resources and learning about my disease and learning about second opinions, and it was a process of empowering myself as a patient too. Like all of these resources give you the tools that you need. Like your providers don't always talk about, they don't have time to make your case the most important case. So you do that through connecting with others who are going through it. The patient to patient movement is real. And I've, I'm here. I, I would not be alive without it. So as I started exploring all those spaces and making connections, it was always a three to one rule in cancer land. And that is 75% women at least to 25% men. Now it's obviously different in your neck of the world because testicular cancer, right? Like, but in colon cancer, it's about 50, 50, maybe like 55% men, 45% women who get it. And, but the, but the people who are accessing the resources are 75, 80% women. And same thing everywhere I went. And I was like, one of two things is happening here. Either I'm just a freak and, and just a weakling who is like the man who struggles and needs help or men are struggling out there and needing help, but they don't feel comfortable accessing these resources for whatever reason. Right. And I kind of knew it was the second I'm like, how could, how could it be that you know, all these guys just are totally, Oh yeah, we got it. No problem. Like, and I'm just like the outlier. I had a strong feeling that men were struggling and suffering in silence, but we're just taught to not engage with help, not seek resources, not connect. And that has all been <laughs> affirmed in my mind over the past several years. So yeah, man up to cancer was my answer to that was to say, Men are struggling. They need a place to vent and connect and support one another, especially in a guy to guy space. Because as I started talking to people about, Hey, why, why aren't men reaching out? The biggest thing that I saw was that a lot of guys just don't feel comfortable being vulnerable or sharing in those co-ed spaces. And that's when the light bulb hit me. It was like, <clears throat> duh, like <laughs> men need a place to, lean on each other and have that brotherhood without feeling like they need to be vulnerable on a co-ed environment. And that's just, that's just reality, right? Like we live in 2023. A lot of people wish that we, everything was genderless and like, you know, we all acted the same, but the fact is even in 2023, so many men are raised in that way to not show weakness, to not show vulnerability, to not cry, to not show their full range of emotions you know, that it's not okay. Right. Hey, you know, you get hurt, you get a challenge, you just suck it up. You rub dirt on it. You move forward. Don't burden anyone else. You know, that's the mentality that still overrides, you know, culture. So, you know, guys need help and they need to lean on one another. So that's, I'm like, all right, I'm going to start something. I'm just going to start a group. I'm going to, I want to do a podcast. Like I I had this vision in my head. It was kind of like, it really was kind of a light bulb moment where I was like, man up to cancer. And we're redefining what it means to man up. Our group is going to be about manning up means yes, bring your toughness to cancer. You're going to need it, but also bring your open heart and your willingness to accept help along the way. We want to redefine man up so that it means accepting help is not a weakness. It's a strength because it means you want to be around for your people. And so just had that idea of like creating a community that would be for men going through all types of cancer. So pan cancer movement just for men, for the emotional camaraderie brotherhood piece. And that's the background of where the community came from. Yeah. And you answered my next question, but um, I was going to ask about the redefining of, of man up because I've seen people even on your friends list, when you've posted man up to cancer, this guy's like, you know, this is offensive to my wife or whatever. And you're (laughs) like, well, like it's not really like that. Yeah. It's been a little tough because it is kind of like a bait and switch. Like when you hear the phrase man up, you think of that traditional, you think of that traditional meaning of it, which is like, you know, again, don't burden others. You like go through it on your own. You can be just being super strong. And and so I I just kind of wanted to co-opt the phrase and it's kind of provocative. People have a lot of reactions to it. So anyone that knows anything about our movement, when they, when they check out my podcast or social media or website, or they enter the group, they realize that 
we have a very different definition to us. It's all about going through it together. That's why the wolf symbol is throughout everything we do is because wolves take care of each other. They're social creatures. If a wolf gets injured or hurt or, or, you know, is in trouble or sick, the other wolves are going to circle around that wolf and protect him until he gets back to health. And if he passes away, they have ceremony where they mourn that wolf, but it's all done as a pack. The lone wolf is exposed. The lone wolf is vulnerable, but as a pack, you have so much more strength. You have so much more knowledge. And that's why we, I chose the wolf to represent us because that's what we want to be for each other with cancer is to say, it's foolish to go through it alone, right? Like you don't, if you go through it as a pack and as a community, and then you're accessing other communities, you have way more tools, you have way more knowledge. You're going to have a better chance of survival. And so I think, yeah, like the phrase itself can be triggering for people, but once anyone, I think, I hope when they check out our stuff, they realize that this is a very um, new take on it. And it's really all about brotherhood and community and, and supporting one another. I don't think you've done like any official studies, but what have you observed to be like the way that this is received and, and from men who are finding that, yes, like you were saying earlier, maybe you were the only one who needed help and you found that that's not true. I mean, what is like the feedback you've gotten? The feedback has been completely overwhelming for the positive. And I'll tell you, I'll give you a couple of examples, but there is a lot of science out there in terms of looking at cultural conditioning, looking at how men and, and women react to a life-threatening illness, whether it be cancer or something else that show that men do have a harder time with the crisis of identity, you know, they, they, and especially at the younger ages, like below 50, there's a lot of evidence showing that the anxiety and depression is higher for males in general. And a lot of that relates to the fact that men often report not having very, very many close friends at all versus women like friendship in itself is a whole different topic that we could have like multiple episodes on because there is a friendship, uh, a lack of friendship epidemic going on, especially for American men. Most American men say they don't have a single male friend that they can confide in, in deeper feelings beyond just superficial talk. So there is a lot of, first of all, there's a lot of scientific basis that show that men tend to isolate more than women when they go through cancer. And we know that isolation leads to worse outcomes, um, relationships breaking up, more substance abuse and mental health problems. So that's like the baseline. And then when you get people in, when you get guys in the group, the evidence that I receive all the time is a guy will come in and he'll say, Hey, yeah, I've been going through cancer for a year. Um, and then they talk about their cancer and then they'll say, I've been feeling, you know, I'm going through something that I haven't talked about to anyone, but I feel like just being here for a while, I feel like sharing it. And then they'll have 20 or 30 guys come in and be like, yeah, man, I feel I've been through that. I know exactly what you're talking about. And so, I see our space as just opening up, pe opening up people to talk about things that maybe they're ashamed of, things that maybe they're embarrassed about that all of a sudden is normalized in our group because everyone else, so many others are going through it. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of like the direct evidence that we get is just men will PM me or email me and say, hey, I was feeling so alone in my cancer journey. I found your group. I came in and now I just it's really helping me. It's, it's, it, I feel like that mental health burden is just so uplifted because I have support now from guys who are going through the same thing. And, and I think that's, you know, and others say, I, I tried out a bunch of other cancer groups and I just didn't feel comfortable, but I feel comfortable in your pack. And I'm not saying this is for everyone, right? Like our space is not for everyone, but for those who really resonate with it, it provides that direct peer to peer social support that maybe they're not getting somewhere else. Yeah. And you mentioned shame with men and like anxiety and depression. I mean, I'm not sure exactly how it is for colon cancer, but I know for testicular cancer, you know, especially if you have both testicles removed, then testosterone is affected and testosterone plays into that kind of thing. So, I mean, what you're talking about is, is especially relevant for. Oh, dude, kind of absolutely. So for people who, um, especially with testicular and prostate people who, you know, the prostate guys who have hormone therapy and have zero sex drive, zero sex life, like sensitive issues around sex and our sex organs and like all that stuff, like that's stuff that's like 
can be really shameful, really isolating. And, and guys in our group can are, are totally free to put that out there. Like we've had people come in and say like, Hey, you know, like my wife and I are really struggling with intimacy and, and, you know, I'm really struggling with shame around this issue and, and effects of my radiation Is anyone else going through that. And they know that there's other guys who are going to jump on and be like, yeah, man, we're, we're going through the same thing. And we know how hard that is. And then those guys can maybe take that conversation offline and people who are together in the same vicinity can get together and meet up for a coffee or beer or, or whatever. Like one of the really cool things for man up to cancer this year is we have more than 30 local chapters now, you know, crop, that have cropped up across um, us and Canada and one in Europe, shout out to David DeWild, testicular cancer guy. Gotta get um, him on. Yeah, he, he's great. Um, but these chapters allow guy that takes it to the next level. Cause you have this online support where you can go and chat and then you have these meetings and stuff, but then you can get together with guys in your area. Um, that is another great tool to avoid isolation. So, but, but to your point, sensitive issues, <laughs> you know, particularly when it comes to, you know, the stuff um, south of the the pelvis and, and, and all the emotional stuff that comes with that. Absolutely. Having a guy to guy space for that is really important. Um, and shout out to Tracy Morgan with the PC tribe. Tracy started the PC tribe as a Facebook group, kind of a little brother group to man up to cancer specifically for prostate cancer guys. Um, so they can have their conversations, you know, that are really prostate based. Our man up to cancer group, like I said, is we probably have 30 plus types of cancer represented in it. So that really makes it, it's not a treatment group. It's not a specifics to your can. It's, it's really what we all face, what we all have in common with going through this as men, as, as, you know, as, as men. And like, when I started out with cancer, I was looking for resources. Like what's it like for a man to go through cancer? What's it like for a husband to go through cancer? And there's just not much out there. So I hope that we're filling that. So there's a chapter in your book um, talking about like toxicity and, and we'll get into toxic positivity later, but um, these guys at Panera were, were talking and, and you had some kind of reaction to that. Yep. And so as I call it the Panera incident and no offense to Panera, cause like I said, in the book, I love, I love Panera. Um, but yeah, the issue. So toxic positivity is like probably my biggest pet peeve as being like a five-year warrior in the journey. And I feel guilty of, of doing it. Like, you know, I don't, I don't know, but no, I mean, I, I mean, and I, I'm sure that people might look at some of my stuff and think that too, like, Oh my God, this guy's super positive. But what I mean by that is as an advocate and someone who now has, you know, somewhat of an audience in the cancer community, I said from day one that I'm going to show it, I'm going to show you all of it. I'm when I'm feeling great and on top of the world and I'm feeling like I'm like, I'm going after my cancer and I'm going to, you know, get through and, and feeling positive, then I'll show you that. But when I'm feeling like <sighs> depressed and anxious and broken and like, I'm never going to make it through. And, and some of those darker feelings, which can be scary. I'm going to share that too, but there's like this faction out there in cancer land that like refuses to accept any negative thinking or any hard thoughts. Like if you say, <clears throat> you know, I think I'm going to die of my cancer. It's like, Oh no, you, you can't think like that. You have to be positive all the time or you're going to affect yourself at the cellular level and, and you're going to, you know, manifest your death. And it's like, <laughs> it's like for me, I feel I'm more unhealthy if I'm not expressing all of the emotions that come with this. Sometimes I get scared. Yeah, that's true. It's, it's sometimes scary to go through stage four cancer. Sorry. Like it's okay to acknowledge that. Like, and sometimes I get negative and, and get depressed. And I feel like if I try to suppress those things or turn them away or like not experience and experience them fully, that I feel like that's worse for my health. So my mentality is to be like, the feelings are going to come. Sometimes you can't control them. And sometimes I have feelings that I'm not comfortable with about, you know, being really negative about where I'm at and, and where, if I'm going to make it or not. And then I just give myself grace to like, hold that experience it to understand that a lot of those harder feelings come from loving our lives, loving our people and not wanting to die. Like this is a fatal illness. Like I've lost, we've lost 130 plus guys in man up to cancer in the past three years. Like to deny that would be for me, like I'm a realist, but I'm also hopeful. So I, I kind of mix both. Like, 
I'm realistic that my disease could very well take my life. And that gives me urgency to live for the now and to do as much as I can right now and in this present moment. Um, but I also have that hope and believe absolutely that I can live a longer lifespan and survive this. So toxic positivity to me is when people in cancer land don't give patients and survivors room to express all their emotions when they don't want to hear anything, but you got this and you're going to beat this and everything's great. And you know, no, you there can't think negative. That's what I'm saying. Like that's, that's something that I don't think is healthy and I don't think it's fair, right? Like how do you put that on a cancer patient to be like, no, no, you got this. You can't think negative. You got to be positive all the time. You don't tell people without cancer can't live like that, let alone a person with cancer. So like, damn, if you got cancer, feel all the shit, man, feel all your feelings. And if someone's telling you that there's no room for that and that, you know, you, you have to be positive all the time, that's, you know, maybe you got to limit your time with that person or, or look for those people who are like, I, you know, what I want from my, from my friends is to just, they don't need to fix anything. They don't need to even fully understand it because there's no way they can, but it's just put, put your hand on my back and be like, you know, that's hard. And and I'm here with you. Yeah, definitely. I, don't, I was going to say, something Oh, I'm sorry. Again. So, Oh, so the, I didn't even tell the Panera. And so, oh, okay. so, so what happened at Panera was, <clears throat> um, it was like six months in, I was in the, I was in the total shit with my treatment and mental health. I was like a wreck. And I go into Panera. It was like the first time I've been out of my house in like a month. And I'm trying to go out and get a couple of gifts for my kids for Christmas. And I sit down to have like a coffee and like a bowl of soup. And the guys next to me are having like this very loud conversation about how cancer is a hundred percent psychological illness. And if you, if you just clear your chakras the right way, you're going to heal yourself. And the reason you got cancer in the first place is because you didn't deal with your psychological mess. And it's like, mm, my, my problem isn't even with that um, belief. Like if you have that belief that it's a hundred percent controllable with the mind, then great. Like that's, that's your decision. But when you're having like a super loud conversation in a public place around people who maybe are going through it, maybe not the best time to just, you know, and like the certainty with which they had this, of course, is just like, Oh yeah. Like, you know, my, my friend got cancer, but went to this retreat and, 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 release their chakras and now they're totally fine. Like it was so offensive to me and so triggering to me as this person who's like, so I wanted to like, <clears throat> Oh, so I, so I got up, I went over it and I just told them, I'm like, look, you can believe whatever you want to believe, but if you're going to have a conversation like this, just be cognizant that you might be next to a stage four cancer patient who's just trying to survive for their 12 and 10 year old kids. And if you want to come over to my house and talk to my daughters about how I caused my cancer because of my psychology, by all means, come on over. And they kind of just, you know, they looked at me like, Oh, we didn't mean anything. We're sorry. This and that. I'm like, no, like, I don't need that. I just, I just think cancer patients don't deserve cancer patients deserve to have some grace and, and shouldn't be shamed into feeling like it's their fault. Like it's not your fault that you got cancer. It's not your fault that you're, that your cancer is progressing, or maybe you pass away from it. I've known the strongest most clean eating people who do everything right. People who think go out go, they, and they do all the integrative stuff too. They, they do all the mind, body, spirit, everything. And they pass away from cancer. Why? Because cancer is a physical illness that is everywhere. It's in pl um, plants, trees, animals, dogs, like cancer is part of the, the natural experience of life. It's, it wasn't because they did something wrong. And so it really bothers me when others, because of their own fear, or their own belief that they want to be able to control everything that happens with their health would make a cancer patient feel, feel like they're doing something wrong if they can't heal themselves. And that, Ooh, as you can tell, like that really gets me fired up because we are just out here trying to survive, like, and doing our best. And we don't need that kind of weight on our shoulders. And I know that you <laughs> t totally understand what I'm getting at here. Yeah. And you mentioned dogs get cancer. I mean, Proof of that, of positivity, not curing your cancer is name a more positive creature than a dog. <laughs> <laughs> so true. I love that. Talk about the growth of Man Up to Cancer from inception to now, because obviously it happened during a, a weird time with COVID. But uh, just last year, you guys had um, the Gathering of Wolves and you mentioned uh, David DeWild in, in Belgium. So, I mean, yeah. it's, it's a wildfire. 
Yeah, it's been it's been crazy. And and I think one of your questions earlier, uh, I forgot to say, like when I started Man After Cancer and when it started to grow, people would ask me, do you really think men are going to open up? Like if you give them a space where it's just guys, do you think it's just going to be like locker room talk and like sports talk? Or do you, do you think they're going to like actually open up about their feelings and what they're going through and everything else? I'm like, hell yeah. Like come spend a day. If you were to look at a day at the post that happened in the howling place, which is our Facebook group, once you give them a place where they feel comfortable, they don't stop sharing. Like it's almost like too much at times. You're just like, Oh my God, it's so overwhelming emotionally. If you're in there a lot. Um, <clears throat> but I guess my point is guys are ready to share. They're ready to do, to do the real thing, like really open up, bond, connect, inspire, love each other to say, you know, we, we, we say that a lot in our group, like, Hey, I love you. And th- even that for so many guys in our group has been like, many of them have never been told by another man that, that they were loved. And so that to me is like what we're, that's really culturally where we're at. So, and I think to your question, that's, what's resonating with people. Like who doesn't want to feel truly connected in this world to have authentic friends that that actually do love you. And people might say, well, social media, it's not really real, blah, blah, blah. But no, these relationships that we develop are real. Absolutely. And hundred percent proof of that is the gathering of wolves. So we had our in-person retreat last year in New York. We had more than 50 guys there from all around us, the Canada and David from Belgium. And we took these relationships that we had started online. And immediately when we saw each other in person, it was just smiles and hugs and love and laughter. And, and yeah, we had our morning times where we remembered the people we've lost and we, and we dug deep into our own experiences and did some real grief work and like tough stuff. But most of the weekend is just playing, you know, cornhole and, and, and drinking some beers and like kicking back and just loving one another and sitting around the campfire. So that's our proof. And, and it, in terms of the growth, I didn't think man up to cancer was going to like really take off or be this thing. I, I just thought it was going to be a small group of like close friends and like some folks I knew through cancer land. Um, Oh, and I, I thought it would grow over time. Like, you know, gradually I'd do a podcast. I I do communicate, I do public stuff, but a couple things happened. <laughs> the first thing that happened was Joe Bullock. I mean, let's just say what it is like shout out to Joe. <laughs> so Joe Bullock is my right hand man. He's the, he, he now has the title of community manager for man up to cancer, but he and I met through Colon town. And when I started the group man up to cancer, like day one, he was like, I'm in, I love this. He's posting. And like, he was all in hundred percent. And so I'm like, dude, like, so I reached out to him. I was like, what do you think about being an admin? He's like, Oh hell yeah. And he's like, I have some friends, you know, Facebook. So this is on Facebook. And he's like, I have some Facebook friends that I I want to invite to the group. I was like, Oh yeah, sure. And literally like within the first, like two weeks of the group, we had like 200, 250 people in it. Like, cause Joe's like the Oprah, he's like the Oprah of cancer land. Like he knows everyone and he like finds everyone. So I always say like, I'm like the vision caster for the group. I'm the founder. I, I, uh, it's, it's my vision. I have an idea of what I want to see in it and I put up the walls and then people like Joe and then others who, who have come in like, you know, Mike really, you know, Don Helgeson, Danny Riggs, Jay Abramovich, like all these guys, they come in and just fill the, <laughs> they fill the place. And, and I always say, I'm really proud to have, have started it and put the, put it together, come up with the idea, but it's the guys in the group who make the magic, right? A group can only succeed based on the quality of its people and their willingness to really go all in. And so Joe was the first one to do that, to be like, Trevor, I think this is great. Let's support these guys. Let's roll. And I'm like, great. And so we just kind of took off. And now, so three years later, we have had to slow down. It's been all organic, all word of mouth. Like we're not out there blasting. We're doing ads or like doing anything like that. Like it's just all really like people come in the group. They're like, this is awesome. I benefit from it. I'm going to go and invite my friend Chuck who just got diagnosed with cancer. Right. And that's how we grow. And so what man up to cancer is now is a group on Facebook called the howling place where we have 2000, a little over 2000 men from all States in the country most Canadian provinces and some in Europe shout out David, Andrew Trollope in the UK. I'm going to forget some guys, but um, 
So we have this, this group of 2000 guys sharing on a daily basis in the Facebook group. And then I have done about 70 episodes of my podcast I've done. And then I have a website. I'm very active on social media with the movement, which is all around men avoiding isolation during cancer. Like that's it. It's not rocket science. Um, we have the annual gathering. So we're going to have the second gathering of wolves this year, 2023 in September um, in New York. And so we're going to scale that. Like, I think we're, probably we're expecting up to a hundred people, maybe, maybe more depending on what happens, but that's in the works right now. We're going to open registration soon. And then what else do we have? We have a chemo backpack program, which I'm really excited about. Um, we send 15 backpacks a month to members of the man up to cancer community that are, have the man up to cancer logo and they're filled with, so you get a blanket, you get a, a water bottle, hydration tabs, um, um, a beanie, um, a journal with a notebook, all, all kinds of stuff that you like gin gins that you would suck on for nausea, all kinds of stuff that people need to go through chemos in this backpack. Um, and we have sponsors. So um, shout out to, if I could real quick, just the two sponsors that have come on so far this year, Natera and garden health last year, we had about eight sponsors and those sponsors provide us the, the, you know, the money to do the backpack program and to do our annual retreat. And I think, and now we have these chapters. So the vision for me is to have an annual retreat and then smaller events throughout the year around like regional events where men can get together. Um, and then we'll see where it goes, but it's really grown into a really solid community that really, again, not rocket science that inspires men to avoid isolation and gives them that direct peer to peer connection. And you're the first podcast I'm going to mention this on. I am going to formally convert man up to cancer this year into a 501 C three nonprofit. Um, I have not done that in the past because of lots of reasons. Number one, there's so many nonprofits in cancer land and so many of them ask their members for support. And I never, ever, and, and, and I never, ever will, as long as I'm in charge of man up to cancer, we will never depend on our members to pay anything. No membership fees. No, we're not going to do any fundraising to them. But the reason I've decided to become a nonprofit is because it just opens the doors up to so many more grants and, and companies that want to give, but you have to be a 501 C three. So it would be foolish of me, not with the growth that we have in the group right now. I just think it's the time to do that. Um, and we have a great leadership team now, you know, I don't know what my future is either. Like I'm still having active cancer, my blood, my tumor markers are up again. So I'm going to be going back into the battle at some point. Um, I want man up to cancer to be a go-to place for men going through cancer for a long, long time. And I think becoming a nonprofit is, is going to help us do that. Yeah, no, I think that's great news. That's awesome. Incredible to hear. Yeah. Thank you, Steven. And, uh, we can't, I know it's all burn organic, but we can't dismiss as somebody who went through kind of was guided to be, to see a doctor coincidentally while watching Grey's Anatomy, Patrick Dempsey, <laughs> is is uh did he did the back cover of your book yeah so patrick you know people don't know this but patrick dempsey founded a lot of people don't know he founded the dempsey center which is a play it's a center in maine they have locations in lewiston maine and south portland maine where they do all the stuff related to cancer except for the actual treatment so all the holistic health they do nutrition classes exercise individual counseling group counseling um reiki massage like it's a, it's a holistic center and everything is free to patients and their families because Patrick and his people do, they have the Dempsey challenge every fall, which is a, a big event. And then they do fundraising throughout the year. So he has created an amazing model for integrative holistic care for cancer patients. And because I'm in Maine, that's the, like, they saved my life and I'm not, exaggerating like patty that's my counselor she's at the dempsey center i don't know what i would have done without them so i was able to meet patrick or pretty early on in my journey over at the dempsey center he was over there and i got introduced to him and he's become a friend and he is the real deal man like that guy people know him as mcdreamy but but i know him as a person who really cares about patients and our families and you know celebrities Sometimes you don't know why they're in it or why they do these things, but Patrick is absolutely the real deal, legit caring dude. And he has been a big supporter for man up to cancer. 
you know? And so he, I was so lucky for Patrick to write the, um, the back cover blurb on my book. Um, and, and just so impressed. And I do have to say real quick that, you know, everyone talked about how beautiful Patrick Dempsey is, his eyes, this and that. And I'm, I was like, whatever. I mean, he's just a human being. Right. And then I met him in person and it's, it's true. It's legit. I'm like major man <laughs> crutch on Patrick. Cause he has, he's so, but, but the thing is, it's not, it's, you know how some people there, they just have a big heart. And that's the thing with Patrick, like people who have that big heart and big spirit, it just comes out no matter what they look like on the outside. And he's one of those people. So shout out to the Dempsey center and Patrick and their whole team. It's a beautiful day to save lives. <laughs> All right, let's. Uh, if there's anything you want to mention that I didn't ask, go ahead and do it, or just go ahead and do your plugs. Um, I think, I think the biggest thing is like my message lately has just all been about, and I said it before, is the word grace. Like just having grace for yourself as a patient for whatever you're going through. Like not being so hard on yourself. Like to, understanding that you have needs and they're going to be different than like a normal person who's not going through a disease. Um, so like for me coming up on five years, I am just so grateful and happy and I am positive to be here cause I never expected to make it to five years. But at the same time, I just want to acknowledge that as we manage cancer as a chronic illness, like without immunotherapy and the surgical techniques that have evolved over the past 10, 20 years, I wouldn't be here. So the fact is like, I'm managing my cancer as a chronic illness. And that in itself comes with hardships, right? Like I have, I have to take prednisone because my adrenal system got shot by my immunotherapy. I have to take thyroid replacement because my thyroid got shot from my treatment. I have tons of scars in my abdomen from my five major surgeries that make daily living sometimes uncomfortable. My feet are half numb from oxaliplatin, the the cancer um, chemotherapy I did. So I guess I'm just saying all this stuff because people might look at me and just be like, well, you know, everything's great. Like you're still here. Everything's awesome. But living with cancer over the long haul comes with its own hardships. So if you're out there and you've been in that long haul, like it's okay to give yourself a break. Like, you know, give grace to yourself. Talk about your needs. Like just cause you are still here doesn't mean you don't have needs. Like I still engage with the Dempsey center services and try to, and need to take care of myself in a different way because of going through this for a long time. So that's been on my mind. Just if there's anyone out there listening who's kind of in the same boat where you've been in this for a while, just acknowledge that it's not always sunshine and rainbows, right? Yeah. Um, and, and then just to normalize all your responses, if you're grieving, if you're anxious, if you're depressed, if you're in those dark places emotionally with cancer, try not to beat yourself up. Try to understand that that's because you're human and you're having a human experience that's difficult. And, and, and it doesn't mean you're going to stay there forever. Like five years ago, four years ago, I was in a place where having a conversation like this, it never would have happened. Like I never would have imagined I would become a cancer advocate and start this group and talking to Steven on this podcast. Like I could have never imagined that because I thought I was going to be in that dark place forever. So for anyone who's in that place, (laughs) we know what it is. We know how hard it is and we know how uncomfortable it is, but we also know that it's temporary and we have absolute hope that you can do some healing on the mental, on on the, on the spiritual side, right? On the heart side, regardless of what's happening with your cancer, I'm living proof still in the trenches, but man, most days are pretty damn good. That's great. And uh, speaking of advocacy, you talked earlier about the stuff I'm doing. I mean, I bow down to you. So, I mean, you're, you're crushing it. Oh gosh, not at all. We are all any, anyone who decides to make that choice, you know, and anyone who doesn't, right? Like if you go through cancer and you decide to make a choice to be involved in trying to help others through it, then great. Like what you're doing, amazing. But for others, if you go through it and advocacy is not for you and you just want to move on with your life, hundred percent. Like there is no expectation on it, but of course I celebrate the work that you're doing the impact you've made in your community is, is just so wonderful. And it just reinforces when we get more guys to, to talk about it, even when it's with a testicular cancer, which is of course all men, even just talking about that 
normalizing discussions around it, um, you know, is a huge cultural shift and you're part of that, man. And I'm super pumped to see you do it. Thank you so much. Um, where can people find man up to cancer? I think the easiest thing is just go to man up to cancer.com. Um, that you can access everything there, the podcast, the, the annual event, the, the Facebook group. Um, if you're on Facebook and you want to check out the group itself, just look up man up to cancer, the howling place. That's our, that's our core. That's our main group. And then for the rest of it, just man up to cancer.com. Sweet. Oh, and the book, but you can't, the, the book, I would love to pitch the book. So I wrote a book, open heart, warrior spirit, a man's guide to living with cancer. It's on Amazon. Um, I'm really proud to be able to do it. And again, it's cause I've had support to be able to do that this fall. Um, but I think, you know, it, it covers what we just had as a conversation. Just put that in book form with a lot of other stuff. And there you go. So thank you, Stephen. Trevor Maxwell, thank you so much. Thank you. It's a real pleasure and honor to be here, man. For more information and resources for your testicular cancer journey, visit testiculaircancerawarenessfoundation.org. You can also follow us on social media at Testis Cancer. We're on Facebook at Testicular Cancer Awareness Foundation.